So what I want to talk to you today about is a project we've been working on for a pretty good while now to uh, study galaxy formation in uh, very little halos, or not so little, about 10 to the 10 solar mass halos. And uh, specifically, this is a project that was part of this uh, set of feedback and mutations that Phil Hopkins has developed and was recently put on, well, not in the last year, put on the archive, um, describing a reasonably successful algorithm. It's called FIRE. Um, and, uh, and in this first paper, we presented this track fairly a fair number of results, but basically showing that the stellar mass halo mass relationship uh, as produced in this um, set of simulations looks pretty good. Today what I want to do is focus on um, some of the smaller, specifically these two dwarfs. So these two dwarfs, the little ones, are the ones that were led by the Irvine group, and specifically Jose and Yorbe, uh, who was a postdoc at Irvine at the time, is the guy who, who started running these dwarfs. And the nice thing about these is because they're small and they have fairly small to ground point, you can actually run them with extremely high force and mass resolution and get to the point where you're starting to resolve the ISM in these systems. Um, so, so why are we so uh, obsessed with these little things? Uh, so, I, so I would say that it is, it's at this mass range, specifically the mass range of 10 to the 10 solar masses in dark matter below, uh, aerial mass, where things are starting to get extremely interesting with a number of, of issues on small scales. And this, this is things that you've heard before, but I, I wanted to uh, just kind of pinpoint this mass scale as a particularly interesting one. Um, the, nice th the nice thing about the scale is, the interesting thing about the scale is it's small enough. It's small enough that there should be lots and lots of payloads of this size. So here is a simulation that Shea Garrison Kimmel produced that's a local volume type simulation that has an M31 and Milky Way type pair. And if you go around and you count how many 10 to the 10 solar mass things there should be within about three megaparsecs of the local group pericenter that are not inside the variable radii of M31 or the Milky Way, the number is something like 10 to 20. So the numbers aren't tremendously big, but it's pretty big, sort of 10 to 20 objects within this volume should have masses of 10 to 10. And if you go out and you count galaxies that are within that volume, there's only four that have stellar masses greater than 10 to the 7. And there are about 10 that have masses greater than 10 to the 6. And so that gives you sort of qualitatively right away a scale based on rough numbers of the kind of galaxies that you expect to sit in halos of mass 10 to the 10. A slightly more careful examination was done by Chris Brook, where he looked at a couple different simulations, including the, some of the clues stuff and the J. Garrett and Kemmel stuff, which is called Elvis counting galaxies in local volume and trying to get a sense of doing the halo mass, stellar mass, sort of abundance magic type analysis there. And again, what Chris found was that at a mass scale of about 10 to the 10, you're talking about 10 to the 6 stellar mass systems. You're talking about, these are pretty small dwarfs, not teeny tiny dwarfs, but sort of classical dwarf type things. So these halos of this mass, they're small enough to be abundant. There should be a fair number of them out there. At the same time, they're massive enough to be dense. So this is a zoom in on an individual halo of, of, of mass 10 to the 10 solar masses. And you know, sort of, this is supposed to be qualitative. These objects are pretty dense. And in fact, the circular velocities of objects of this size are about 40 kilometers per second. Um, why is this interesting? Well, 40 kilometers per second is a pretty deep potential well. And in fact, it's well above the scale where you think reionization ought to do anything. So in, a sense, in that sense, they're big enough that they pretty much always ought to form a galaxy. And in that sense, these are the objects that are too big to fail. There's no good reason why they shouldn't be forming stars. In them. Now, when you go out and you measure the densities of little galaxies that look like this, they're not dense enough, especially if you ask a theorist. If you ask a theorist, they say, look, these galaxies are not dense enough. Observer says, no, 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 your halos are too dense. But there's a mismatch in density, right? Galaxies of mass 10 to the 6 solar masses are simply not as dense as the cores of 10 to the 10 solar mass halos, at least as you would produce them in dissipationless simulations. <clears throat> so this is the essence of what 
we call the two-day to fail problem that, for example, if you look within the Milky Way variable radius now, and you count all galaxies that were pretty big when they fell into the Milky Way's variable radius, and you plot what their rotation curves look like, they look like the lines, this purple line. If you look at the, at the masses of the local group of dwarfs, they all lie low. So there's all these sort of missing massive things, these massive failures that are too big to fail. This is the case for the Milky Way. If you play the same game and look at galaxies within the real radius of uh, Andromeda, you see the same deal, that there's all these dense things there that really aren't accounted for by the 10 to the 6-ish stellar mass things that by number ought to be hosting them. Um, if you look throughout the outer local group, and so in this picture that I showed you before, so if you count galaxies in the vicinity of the local volume, but not within the real radius of M31 and Milky Way, you see the same issue. And in fact, this qualitative problem has been around for a while, that if you go out even into the field, and you look at galaxies, and you measure things, you, know, you measure the rotation curves, and <laughs> compare them to uh, what you, the kind of halos you would expect them to sit in, Again, you find that they're not really sitting in those kind of halos. So there's, a, there's an abundance issue and density issue. So it's very difficult to get the abundances and the densities right at the same time at this scale. And this is a tendency that's seen not just in the very radius of the Milky Way, right, but in M31, throughout the local volume, and at very large distances. Yeah? You're calling that density, but those are each one rotation curves. Do you, do you still mean density, or is it a mass issue, or is it? It's the same thing, right? It's the square root of gm over r. So it's mass, density, whatever you want to say. There's too much mass within a radius. So this is a, I, I should say, this is a more recent paper by uh, Papa Sergis, and they did something, they, they're framing this problem in a slightly different way. They're basically doing abundances on, on velocity widths. So they're basically doing abundance matching now on velocity widths, creating velocity, basically a velocity function, mapping that to the halos then that they should sit in, and then comparing them one by one and finding that things are under dense. But qualitatively, it's a very similar, you know, it's a similar problem. And I would just point out that the scale where things are going nuts is right around 40 kilometers per second. So it's the same scale that keeps popping, popping up in lots of different places. So this issue with too big to fail, I should sort of character, you know, say that I find it particularly disturbing, and I don't think that, I mean, there are a lot of interesting ideas about ways to solve too big to fail, specifically when you focus on the scale of the Milky Way that have to do with environmental things that can basically a source of energy to try to remove dark matter. You could argue that it's a statistical fluke, that the Milky Way is just odd, or that the Milky Way's mass is lower than we may have thought. But I think these kind of solutions that are focused solely on the Milky Way are kind of missing the forest, because there's lots of other you know, there are other indications out there that little halos like this are just not as dense as you would think they should be. And I think this is actually independent of whether it's a core or a cusp, by the way, right? I mean, this is just absolute mass density at a radius. So it doesn't matter if you're, you know, measuring slopes or cusps, cusps versus cores in that sense, it doesn't matter. It's just that things are less dense than you think. So, so in that sense, you know, that's what sort of drives us, I think, back to this question of feedback. So maybe it's really just an internal process. It's something that's a property of all little galaxies that drives these densities low. Okay, and this, these ideas have, have been around for a while. It's a nice paper by Gavernado et al. showing that if you have lots of blow, stuff blown out the center of your dark matter halo, you can basically shock the potential and you evacuate the orbit of those dark matter particles and they just don't go back there anymore and the density goes down. The issue is, can you do this at the stellar mass scale that we're concerned about? So this 10 to the 10 stellar mass scale of dark matter corresponds in abundance, roughly, we think, to the 10 to the 6 stellar mass galaxies. So when you only have 10 to the 6 stellar masses of stars, the question is, do you have enough energy to play with? Is there enough energy to remove those cusps? And <clears throat> it's a compilation of some results, again, by Gavrinato et al. in 2012 where they're showing their results for simulations in red. And basically the point of this is this is more core-like, upward and downward is more cusp-like. And if you're above this solid line, you've produced some pretty good cores, but as you approach this solid line, you're back to the cusp regime. And in this sense, right around 10 to the 7 solar masses, things in these little galaxies just look cuspy. 
And these are sort of, they're sort of relevant pa other papers that are related to this by Peña Ruby et al. and Garrison Kimmel et al. that have sort of made the point that the energetics get hard when you're on this scale. This is another uh, result from Desinto et al. more recently. You can focus, for example, what's plotted here is the ratio of the total mass in stars to the halo mass. And the galaxies we're concerned about have ratios of 10 to the minus 4. Okay, and so what they were finding is that basically a scale where the stellar mass to halo mass ratio is uh, very, very low, and basically things go back to the FW. So it's this scale that we sort of were interested in attacking to see if you know, do you ever get pores here. Um, so this is, this is a set of simulations that I introduced a little bit before um, using the spire implementation running fairly high resolution, quite high resolution zoom in simulations of cosmological dwarf halos and then even smaller systems. So these are sort of 1,000 solar mass dark matter particle resolution, 250 solar mass gas mass resolution, and the force resolution of the dark matter is 25 parsecs. Um, so this is small enough, this is high enough resolution that you should be able to resolve sort of 300 parsecs in the cores robustly. Um, and that's basically the half-life radii of one of these little dwarfs. Um, so we have basically, the, the runs I want to talk about are basically, there's three runs of something we're just going to call dwarf. And those all have halo burial masses of 10 to the 10. And in fact, they're all run with the identical initial conditions. So it's a typical mass accretion history, spin parameter, concentration, halo, just taken from in the field in isolation. Same exact initial conditions. Small changes to the implementation of the subgrid, basically an energy injection algorithm. Nothing major. It's not like you're changing the efficiency of supernova or whatever. It's things like how you distribute the energy, whether you do a volume weight or uh, a mass weight within the kernel where you're putting the energy and momentum in. So just reasonable choices. You just sort of say, well, we can do this, we can do that. With those changes, every single, all three of these runs produce the same total stellar mass, and they all produce a galaxy that has a stellar mass of about 10 to the 6, which is what you want. So that's very nice. This is, these are the kind of hills you want. These are the kind of galaxies you want living in these hills. Finally, we do a, one, something we call an ultra faint, just for fun, so a slightly lower, system, lower mass system that's more susceptible to things like reionization. It ends up producing a stellar mass of 10 to the 4, so it does sort of look like an ultra faint. In total stellar, an ultra-faint dwarf in total stellar mass, but also it forms its stars very early. Here's where these systems sit um, on an abundance matching relationship. So what's plotted here is stellar mass versus halo mass. These lines are basically abundance matching results produced from doing the local, local volume abundance matching. Um, from Brooke et al. and then the same stuff with shade Garrison Kimmel produced earlier. And the nice, so and what's plotted here is, all, there's three points here from our simulations, the big red ones, and then this is our ultra paint. And also shown up there are just some other reasonably exhaustive uh, uh, compilations from things that are published in the literature. And so here are the two we're looking at, and we're, again, pretty happy with results in terms of just the stellar mass halo mass relationship, 10 to the 10 solar mass halo, 2 times 10 to the 6 stellar mass galaxy, here we've got something, again, 3e9 and 10 to the 4. This is all pretty nice. Let me, let me just focus first on the ultra faint, because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, this is the star formation history of this ultra faint system. This is the cumulative star formation history. And then you see that it formed its stars pretty early and then just stops forming stars. So it's normalized to 1. Interestingly enough, it forms actually most of its stars after reanimation. So what's going on, and there's this idea, right, that these little things should not form stars after reionization. <clears throat> but, you know, that, that's a very simplified way of thinking about reionization, what reionization should do. What reionization does, in a broad sense, it stops fresh gas accretion into these little things. But it doesn't necessarily kill ongoing gas. You know, it doesn't necessarily kill star formation that's already from gas that's already cooled and basically self shielded What this thing eventually does is it it, it, it self-quenches eventually because it loses its fresh gas supply. And it self-quenches by Z3. Okay. So seeing 
stars that are primarily old in a dwarf like this doesn't necessarily mean that you're seeing a reionization fossil. Now this thing doesn't actually form, this thing forms so few stars that you might not be surprised by this, but if you look at its dark matter density profile, it's very cusped. So it looks basically identical to running this thing again in collisionless with just the dark matter. The density profiles of dark matter sit right on top of each other. They're both cusped. Let's look now at the star formation histories of those other dwarfs, which is sort of the main thing I want to talk about. Um, um, so these dwarfs, these things in red, they form a total stellar mass between 2.2 and 2.8 tenths of the 10. So nicely, they, they basically form roughly the same amount of stars, but they form that at a different time. So, there's this thing we're just calling early dwarf. It forms a lot of its stars early, and then there's a late dwarf. It just forms more of its stars later. Those are the main differences in these things. They're all bursty star formation histories. They're just pop, they're popping off all the time. Um, but in a gross sense, cumulatively, this one forms early, and this one forms a little later. If you then look at their dark matter density profiles, they stratify in the same way. So what's plotted here in black is the density profile of the dark matter halo that's, um, that you get in a collisionless run. The late forming dwarf produces a very big core, very big meaning one kilopart sec. The early forming dwarf produces a core that you can barely resolve within the power radius of this halo. Okay. So you're seeing this stratification, and you sort of notice this stuff's kind of interesting. But if you think about how dark matter halos form, you might not be surprised that this is what we're seeing. So, how does a little dark matter halo like this form? Well, at early times, there's lots of merging, and basically the cusps get set. So what's plotted here is the mass within a given radius, 300 parsecs, 750 parsecs, 2 kiloparsecs, this is the variable radius, as a function of look back time. So this is early and this is late. Sorry, it's a function of age of the universe. So this way is early and this way is Z of zero is down here. Um, and so what happens here at early times, there's all kinds of mergers and the cusp is basically being made. This is when the cusp of the CDM profile is made. But then at later times, because these are low mass systems, they, they're done, right? They form early and they're done. So there's this early period of time, and in this particular run, it's before about the Z of two, where you have act, active cusp formation. The central region of the halo is just popping like this. And then at late times, the thing just sits there, its mass density is set, and it just is constant for 10 billion years. So if you look at the star formation histories, and you think about what might happen for stars that are formed early versus late, all of the star formation that occurs early has a very tough battle making cores. Because it makes a nice core, and then what do you know, there's another merger that just comes in and pops that thing back up. But if you form a lot of stars late, after the point where that central region is basically set, then you can produce that core and it just hangs out. And it can survive. So just to sort of demonstrate this, this is one of the, one of the dwarfs shown in the movie here. Um, and what's shown is just redshift is up here at the right, black is the CDM only run, and red is the one with gas. And you see that the gas cores are just being blown out, and then they're just popping back. There's just lots of mergers going on, and especially at early time, even if you even if you do blow out a big core, it just pops right back. Because these things are just they're just undergoing all kinds of mergers. But now you hit redshift about two, and you'll see things kind of stabilize a little bit. And you start seeing this core kind of persist. There's not that really many mergers going on anymore. Now most of the fluctuations you're seeing are driven by secular stuff, star formation and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, it just kind of follows on forever now, and then you'll see this core kind of kind of misproduced. You can see this in a, in a different way, now just in a different figure, 
What's plotted here is a little bit ugly, so let me just sort of walk you through it. There's sort of two different things plotted on this plot. They all have the same horizontal axis, so this is just time uh, along the bottom. And if you look at these sort of squiggly lines here, this is the mass within a few different radii. So the yellow is mass within 0.3 kiloparsecs. This is mass within 750 parsecs. And this one's mass within 2 kiloparsecs. And it's plotted in as a ratio. So it's a ratio to the dissipationless run. So a number of unity means you basically produce exactly the same density at that radius, mass at that radius as the dissipationless run produced. But a low number means you've made a core, you've carved out some mass. And so in this early, and sorry, this late forming dwarf, um, so, uh, sorry, the other thing in the dashed line here, this is the cumulative star formation history. So um, one is here, and so this is, this is where the stars are forming. And so you see at this early time, at this line here, where there's all kinds of mergers going on, the, the mass ratios are just going nuts because you might make a little core and then it immediately it comes back. But then after this time when the halo settles down, this late star formation drives the formation of this kind of big dwarf. So, but over here in this early dwarf, you do most of your star formation during this kind of chaotic bumping around time. And then it just kind of stabilizes this sort of minimal core. So, you know, this is just one initial condition and a few runs, but these are pretty expensive things to do. But I think this general trend qualitatively might be something we expect. And if so, it's nice. So I, I think that where we're living, right, is we're living on this edge. We're at a stellar mass range where there's just barely enough energy to do anything. And if you waste that energy early on, you're, you know, that's bad. Because then you're not going to produce any more. You want to save that energy up until the halo is all done making its cusp, and then you use it and you try to and you try to build that core. If this is generally true, it's kind of interesting because you might then expect there to be a trend that if you look at galaxies as a function of their cumulative star formation histories, um, you might expect galaxies to form their stars early to be more cusp-like, and galaxies that form their stars late to be more core-like and fixed cell mass. And you know, qualitatively, you might also expect them to not only be cuspy, but denser. You know, these might be denser, and these might be less dense. There's going to be a lot of scatter in this, but it would be interesting to sort of look for these kind of trends. So upshot here, so what are my conclusions on this? So I started framing this in terms of too big to fail, and trying to argue that maybe we need to go back and look at feedback as a way to solve this. I used to be pretty, pretty skeptical about whether it would even be remotely possible for feedback to do this. Um, I now think that maybe, you know, maybe it's possible. I would still say maybe. There's a couple issues with this tour, but I, I do like a lot of the things that it's done. So the stellar mass and halo mass, we're getting, I think, pretty happy with this. The metallicity is sort of subtle, but it is low. And I think it looks a little funny. Um, I haven't talked about that much. The H1 mass actually is pretty good for a dwarf like this in the field. Um, this thing is also, the, the core that, the dwarf that makes the big core, the dwarf that produces this kind of low density. Um, it's also kind of big. So it's physically a large system. It sort of puffed itself out. And for a galaxy of a million stellar masses, a half-life radius of one kiloparsec is big. So this thing is kind of big, so I don't like that about it. And also, if you plot it, if you look at the dark matter mass divided by the variant, total baryon mass in the core of this halo, it's also above unity. And that's not good. That's not what these kind of dwarfs really look like, as far as we can tell right now. So I think this is also a little low. But all in all, you know, this is sort of an interesting direction. And I think maybe this correlation between when the stars form and the presence of a core cusp um, is, you know, pretty exciting, maybe. Um, so I will uh, I'll just put up my conclusions here. I would say this. For cusp versus core, I think especially this low mass regime, um, I think it's not just about how many stars you have, but it's when the stars form. And there were some ideas earlier, actually, that if you form your stars early, that helps you with this core problem because the potential well is somehow not as steep then. But I think it's actually the opposite of that. If you form your stars early, that's when the cusp is being made. You don't want to just get rid of the cusp because it's just going to regrow. 
you want to farm your stars late. If you farm your stars late after the halo is stabilized, that's probably the time when you're going to win. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is sort of a secondary conclusion is that just because you see mainly old stars in a dwarf, it doesn't mean it's this has anything to do with well, it doesn't mean it's reanimation necessarily. You're not necessarily only not necessarily seeing stars that only form before reanimation. The feedback, what you know what happens when you have reanimation is pretty subtle because what really happens is you just keep new gas from accreting into the system. So what happens subsequently, of course, it makes you more you know, likely to have your star formation shut off. But you still need probably some salt quenching, and that, that cycle of star formation can last for a couple billion years after the reanimation is gone. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I think that's true, but I think that you know, in, if if we do believe, if we have a rough sense of what the halo mass is, you're not going to have major mergers in 10 to 10 solar mass halos. That would be one. one. So I think you're right, and, but I, I do think that in some qualitative sense, whether they had major mergers Yeah, I, and so I think it's sort of where it's going. But like, it looks like the real discerning power is in here, and maybe things look the same, but. I, Compared to the total baryonic mass, so yeah. Is, can you just look at this kind of mass halo, or does it mean you're in the mass halo? Is that, is that, is that, is that you could just move the mass by hand to 
I think if you got rid of this gap, I mean, be a little careful here. Because I think we don't. The dark matter to stellar mass ratio is actually okay in this system. So what I'm talking about is the dark matter to total bare atom mass. This thing has a lot of gas. And if you actually count the amount of mass, it's just the baryon, the baryon, the dark matter mass is of order unity. And my reading of the current literature, at least for galaxies locally, is that ratio tends to be higher. Now, it could be that there's some other mechanism that you just remove a little bit of this gas somehow and think it would be all right. I don't know if this is a, I don't, I don't know if this is a deal breaker, but I'm just saying that it, this is one issue that I see with this that doesn't look perfect. And I don't know exactly how the best way to solve it. So first, just a comment that the Gasoline group, we have formed uh, dwarf galaxies at this serial mass that do have substantially flatter dark matter density profiles. So they might not be an alpha equal zero core, but they are definitely not cusps. Um, we tend to the six stellar mass of the stars. I'm sorry? We tend to the six stellar mass of the stars. No, with higher stellar mass. But if you go down to lower halo mass and hence lower stellar mass, we do form dwarfs with substantially lower dark matter mass within their inner one for the parsec. It has a very similar effect to what you're saying here. Um, and a question. So you, you can lower the dark matter density as you were describing here, but does that actually solve the numbers problem? Because the too big to fail problem has sort of two issues, right? One is that the dwarfs are too dense in a dark matter only run. But the other is that you have too many of them, right? If you took all your 10 to the 10 solar mass halos and you gave them these density profiles, you'd be okay. It's just a density problem. I mean, if you took all the massive dwarfs and you made them less dense, you're good. Your goal is probably better. That's why people like, I mean, SIDM but, does the same thing. But then wouldn't you be predicting something like 10 fornexes? No, because the stellar mass is 10 to the 6. That's the whole point. These things, these things host Dracos, not fornexes. 